So I'm, I'm subbing, okay? I can hardly see you, um, but, uh, but that's okay. Um, so here, here's the thing to know about when I open the Word of God and try to teach it. Um, if you fall asleep, that is totally cool, okay? Like respect, you know what I'm saying? Wakanda forever, right? So, because if you can sleep when I talk, I think you earned it. So if I see you going to sleep, just enjoy. But my hope is uh, this will be a wake-up moment. I was preparing for, uh, for this message and uh, trying to think through what exactly, uh, when John shared it with me, I'll tell you a little more about that you know, that um, what the passage was. I was kind of thinking about it, and, and many things came to my mind, and I realized that one of the, the great introductions would be to use an Aggie joke I like. Are any of y'all Aggies? Are there any Aggies? Okay, I'll go real slow. So, uh, so no, really, it's nothing about Aggies. I grew up, where's J.D.? If J.D.'s here, it's Auburn, Alabama. That's what I grew up with. So, you know, it was all Auburn, Alabama. It was always... Like back in the day, Shug Jordan was the coach and of Auburn and Bear, and they had all these Bear Bryant Shug Jordan jokes, and that you know come like Shug's walking up with a pig, and Bear says, "Hey, where'd you get him?" And the pig says, "Oh, I won him at a raffle," you know, stuff like that. Or why do they put manure on the field at Auburn? You know, and that's to keep the flies off the homecoming queen. <clears throat> so. This Aggie, uh, Auburn grad went into a uh, chainsaw store and uh, was getting all the details on the, on the hottest uh, new chainsaw. And the guy said, look, you can cut four cords a day with this machine. It's incredible. It is truly amazing. And uh, he said, man, I'll take it. And about two weeks later, he comes back and said, this is no good. I can only get one cord out of it a day. And the salesman says, I can't understand that. And he checks the dials and stuff, the gas and all. Run, 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 na, 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 na. And the Auburn guy says, what's that noise? <laughs> See, if you don't understand something, it's real hard to use it. By the way, on the way home, some of you will get that joke. It'll be like, oh, that was so funny. So, <laughs> so understanding, I, I would call this, if I, if I can get permission to do it, I'm going to try to share with you kind of the process, um, at least I go through in trying to make sense of a passage and trying to share it with people. Because I think if you would look at this skill orientation, it would, it would make a difference. So when, when John and I uh, were chatting, he said, hey, uh, you want to preach? And I said, sure. And uh, he said, here's the passage. And then I told Jody, and she said, great. And then Jody came back and said, that passage only has a few verses in it. She said, I wish you had a longer passage. And then when she and I talked about it, I said, honey, there are three sermons in it. I think four, actually. Uh, I think I could go four or five hours on this passage. And uh, so we laughed because what I've learned over time is that there's this relationship between the Word of God and our lives. And pretty much what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get myself to think like God does. Uh, not in an arrogant way, but his, think his thoughts after him, he's told me. And, and I want to get them clear, and then I want to think about you and what you're wrestling with in life, and I'm trying to get you to think like I do. And so in that bridging, we're getting the whole of the Word of God together. But that comes together by skill. So, shamelessly, plug, uh, just published a book this week called The Independent Homeschool. So Jody and I... Uh, Grew five kids, uh, homeschooled them all the way through. Uh, then they went to various colleges and careers. They're all married and they have kids and they're, you know, doing life and plugging along. But, but in here in chapter 11, by the way, the subtitle is How to Cheerfully and Peacefully Educate an Independent Learner Without Getting Stressed Out, Burned Out, or Constantly Irritated. Right? Little known fact, I'm actually 96 years old. See, that's how de-stressed my life is. Isn't that cool? So, the independent homeschool, in chapter 11, I basically go through my view, my view of education. <clears throat> Everybody's awake now. Uh, my view of education is, education is really about skill development. It's really about skill development. And, and, and uh, commonly in, in America, uh, it's, it's common 
to make education about knowledge, about information, about data, about uh, learning stuff, knowing things. And what we stressed was, no, it's really about learning skills. And if you can learn these skills, life becomes amazing for you. You don't know the, you know, uh, I have a kid that just moved to, uh, our oldest moved to uh, North Carolina. He probably doesn't know anything about uh, North Carolina, the history of the state, or anything like that. But I'll bet you if he needed to, in about, in about um, ooh, a week, he could get a few books, read it, and know more than anybody he knows there. Because he has an incredible ability to read. That's amazing. And when you get the ability to read, or you get the ability to do math and, and cipher, you know, uh, make sense of some things logically, or you get the ability and you develop that, hone that skill to be able to write or articulate what you're saying uh, with language, there is magic that comes in your life, but you, you can tap into the minds of people throughout history and throughout the world just like that. It's not about knowing all the capitals in America. That's fine, but it's about developing the skill. And so with that in mind, what I want to do is take this passage we're going to look at and see if I can just show you kind of the process, at least I go through, and if you have the opportunity to uh, prepare uh, to teach people, maybe this process will help you. So uh, here we go. We're in Matthew chapter 13, and it's verses 53 through 58. So I'm going to read them. It says, when Jesus had finished these parables, what John's been going over the past um, uh, some weeks, he says, uh, when he finished these parables, he departed from there. And he came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue with the result that they were astonished and said, where did this man acquire this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is his mother not called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man acquire all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. So when you come to a passage like this, what you're trying to do, at least in my mind, is I'm trying to figure a couple of big things out. So the first is I want to know who the players are, and then the second I want to look at the movement, okay? So this is about as technical as I'm going to get, but it's very helpful if you'll do this when you read, especially something narrative like this. So, so who are the players in here? So we look through. So who's the first one? Jesus. Jesus is always the right answer in church. It doesn't matter what it is, you know? <laughs> Just say Jesus. All right, so Jesus, okay, departed. Let's see. Uh, he came to his hometown, began teaching in their synagogues. So who are the there? Town folks, yeah, Jesus is fine too. He was one of them because he grew up there. But yeah, the town folks, the citizens of Nazareth, okay? So Nazareth, Nazareth is there all from um, uh, Gennesaret, the, the, the sea there. Uh, up higher, there are cliffs there. Uh, it's really kind of a pretty little spot, at least I thought when, when I was there. The cliffs are dangerous enough to be thrown off of. Uh, but they, they have townspeople. They're, they're the people of that town, you know, like... We might say New Braunfelites or whatever we're called. Uh, so it's, it's, that, it's that group. Who else is in here? Yeah, so we got his family, exactly. So we got uh, Joseph, uh, implied carpenter's son, Mary, brothers, um, sisters. So we got this family group. And that's pretty much the players. So we got the, home, the townspeople, we've got Jesus, and we got his family being referred to. But those are the players. So, so when you look at that and you see the players, then you know that there's an interaction going on between Jesus and the hometown people and uh, maybe some involving his family and Jesus, okay? So then you want to look for the movement. <clears throat> and the movement is, movement is something goes from here to some other place. Some action is taken, that kind of thing. And so when I look at this, the first thing, is, as I reflect on it, the first bit of movement was he departed from there, right? Uh, and, and came to the hometown. So where was there? Well, if you go in context, you look it up. 
It was, he was in a house, I think Capernaum, uh, kind of where he was located there uh, on, on the uh, Sea of Galilee, uh, Gennesaret. So he, he was in that house and he finished these parables with the disciples and then he left there and went back to his hometown. So, so <clears throat> there's, a, there's a movement, that's what you're looking at. And so he goes to the temple and he speaks. And, and, and as you look at this, I would just say it comes down to this. The movement is this. Jesus himself makes an offer. So, so when, when you see he taught them in their synagogue, he's offering truth, right? He's, he's telling them uh, stuff of value, just the same in the context with the parables. He's given mysteries of the kingdom. He's uh, preaching the kingdom. He, he's, he's telling them truth, eternal truth that will transform their lives, this world, all eternity, right? He's making an offer. Now, what did they do? What's their response to the offer? Yeah, exactly. I heard it. Reject, right? They just rejected. They're offended. They reject the offer. They do something further as you look in here uh, at the very bottom. So they reject him, and there's this discussion. Uh, Jesus explains the problem. A prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown, in his own household. And then in verse 58, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And so what you find is they reject his teaching, and then they do a rejection because of his, or rather in their unbelief, and then Jesus actually rejects them, doesn't he? Doesn't do many miracles there. That's at least the, the nature of what you see, and, and that's the flow of this conversation. He comes to town, he preaches in the synagogue. They are offended and reject him. They don't know where this miraculous stuff comes from. And then he explains what's going on, and they further just simply don't believe. And as a result, he doesn't do miracles. Got it? And and when you come to a passage that way, it's great because you can make sense of it. But there's another piece to to the nature of looking at the Bible, and, and especially if you're teaching with other people, because... Uh, the first part is just to know what it's saying, right? You really want to know what it says, what it means by what it says. But then the next question is your audience. So what are their needs? What are they wrestling with? What are they going through? And some of those needs are unique to the moment, and some of those needs are universally human. And so, so when I look at this and I think about needs, um, I go, okay, so here's a, here's a first sermon, I mean, how many are first message? How many of us have not experienced the hatred of our hometown? I mean, haven't you had that before? It's like, you know, my family doesn't get me, you know. Haven't you ever had that experience? Like you have some ability or some gift. It's, Jody, if you, uh, uh, last week we were talking with Brooks, the youngest. He's 26 now. And she said, Brooks, I'm so sorry, but every time I dream about you, you're always three. And I'm not sure that's just in the dreams. I think in her mind, Brooks is always three. You know, double major in economics and mathematics, programmer, perfect SAT score, one of those people. But she probably would still want to help him with his math, you know, just because it's my baby. Well, well, that, that phenomenon really happens, that, that we have this, uh, this hatred of the hometown, of the dismissal. And, and we see it here. These people, they're going, hey, wait a minute. Carpenter's son, mother, we know, brothers, we know. He grew up among us, didn't he? Why, where'd this come from? And, and, and commentators speculate, is it a demonic thing? Are they are thinking it came from some demonic place, some weird um, outcome? They couldn't explain it. They always knew him. He's not special. And there are, there are all kinds of research on this stuff like the Dunning Kruger effect and they have egoism and um, superiority uh, some another designation if you'd like to read all that stuff and, and, and it basically was sub- described as the late Wobegon syndrome so there's Garrison Keillor famous late Wobegon days blah 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 but the whole point was all the kids at Lake Wobegon were above average and this is a phenomenon with us humans. We all think if you test people about are you better than the average driver, it's like 90% think they're above average <laughs> as drivers or in intelligence or in ability. And so there's something 
egotistically in the human soul that we look at people and go, I grew up in the same town you did. I'm the same person as you. Uh, why aren't we the same? And occasionally somebody breaks through. Some years ago, I was sitting, um, must confess, with the conversation started in the restroom. We were washing our hands, and we walked out, and I kept talking to this guy, and he was telling me about his son. His son's a great football player, just a great football player in high school, like sophomore. And I told him, I said, you know, oh, Bob, I, I tell you, I see this all the time. Maybe he's great. Yay, team. But I've had more parents over my entire lifetime. Their kids are going to play pros, and they're going to play college, and they're going to play this and this, and some do. We watched the Knicks boys in Midland, Texas grow up, and they went on to play uh, pro baseball. But, but honestly, most of the time, we're just not realizing the level of competition and commitment it takes as you go up. And he said, well, that may be true, but my little son, Timmy Tebow, is, is really some." Do you go through moments where you have something to really offer your family or your friends and they just dismiss it because they think, I'm like you, I know what you know? That, that would be that issue here. And, and I think what Christ would be telling us, I mean, there would be one implication would be, why don't you notice the special nature of those in your family in town that God may just flat out gift people? Wouldn't that be cool? But the other way around would be you. I, I think you could just catch on that this is how it goes. You know, this is awful. So I wrote this book on homeschooling. How many, how many of my kids are going to read this book? 0.00. .00. Why? That's dad. That's, we know that. We got the course. Been there, got the course. We grew up in it. We understand it. Here's the problem with that sermon that I just did, that little message, is it says a prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and in his own household. And guess what? You are not a prophet. I mean, you might be, but the way most of you are not, okay? Because it's a rare thing. It's prophets who get dishonored or not dishonored. Prophets who get respected somewhere else. Prophets... It wasn't really talking necessarily to all people. So this is kind of a minor theme. I don't think anything I said was wrong, but I don't think that's what the passage is at. So I go to message number two. What's message number two? I, I see a message here that, that asks and begs to answer the question, does Jesus offend you? Does Jesus offend you? Your first response, I mean, you've been playing this game a little bit, so you go, oh, no, Jesus, I, we're good, you know, kind of forever, that kind of thing, yeah. So, yeah, really, you don't find things in here as you read his word, read what he taught, like, um, like, I don't know, don't lay up treasure on earth, lay it up in heaven. Why don't you get up and think about giving a cup of water in his name? Get out there and serve others. I know we preach that, but I'm not talking about preaching. I'm talking about doing, right? But there are other things he'll talk about. It, it might be uh, controversial. It might be cultural. It might be he thought the Jews were special. That irritates people. Uh, there's a, he seemed to think Adam and Eve were real. That kind of messes up some theories out there about how reality began. I found that if you read the Word of God, the parts you don't like are probably the parts that the Lord's kind of talking to you about, Right? But I could go, are you offended? I mean, here these people are. It's striking. He came to his hometown, verse 54, began teaching in their synagogue with the result that they were astonished. Whoa, this man, miracles, wisdom. It's crazy. Where'd he get them? 
and they took offense at him. Uh, this book can be offensive. It just can. And it's offensive because it is uh, throwing us in a place of stark, like in your face, contradiction between this image you have of yourself being a good person, right? And the reality that you may fall short just a little bit of what God intends. And I, I would say if, 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 we, if we develop this, you know, the message is, hey, don't be like the people in Nazareth, right? Uh, worse, go back. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, these cities. If, if Sodom and Gomorrah basically had seen the miracles back then that you saw, they would have long ago repented. You had access to the living God that showed up, did miraculous things among you, taught you truths that will change everything, and your response is, oh. or, huh, who does he think he is, God? Actually, yes, he does. But see, here's the problem with that message. Uh, that's not the point. So you have to come back and say, well, what's the point of this sermon? Or, excuse me, the point of this passage and the point of this passage is, is the key. That's what we're looking for. And, and so you go through this story, this movement of these key players, Jesus and the hometown folks and his family, and you've got, uh, he offers something, they reject it once uh, because they're offended, reject it again in their unbelief. Christ explains it to them, but then he rejects them. And the point is verse 58. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. What does that mean? That means that there's a relationship between our faith and God's response or doing. By the way, this, this was not new to them. If you look over in Luke chapter 4, uh, you can see, I, I don't want to belabor it, but it's really kind of important because we left out a group in the passage. So we got the family, right? Well, we got the Jesus, we got the townspeople, we got the family. But inside the townspeople, there are two groups. And most of the ones that are offended and unbelieving, but some clearly believed because he did some miracles, the way I take it. So if you look at Luke chapter, uh, chapter 4, uh, he goes in, th this is much earlier, he had already been to his hometown. It's before the disciples were selected. He's already done this whole story with them. He's going back for more in our passage. But in this earlier one, you pick up, he gets up, he reads uh, from Isaiah in the synagogue, verse 21, he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And in verse 22, Luke chapter 4, he says, and all the people were speaking well of him. And admiring the gracious words which were coming from his lips. And yet they were saying, is this not Joseph's son again? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb, physician, heal yourself. All the miracles that we heard were done in Capernaum. Uh, do here in your hometown. Hey, we heard you've been doing stuff. Hey, do it for us too. But he said, I, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. This is clearly not how to win friends and influence people, you know. Jesus did not have access to Dale Carnegie's work. Verse 25, but I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months and then a severe famine came all over the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Jerophath in the land of Sidon uh, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many with leprosy in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now, what he's saying is some, not everybody, not everybody buys it, not everybody gets it. He did that with the soils. Obviously, not everybody's going to uh, uh, embrace it and keep it and be fruitful. And so here, here, here we are again in the same uh, process, 
In the same context, much earlier, Jesus is having the same conversation, and all the people in the synagogue, verse 28, were filled with rage as they heard these things. Kind of a, we're not good enough for you? I'm speculating, sanctified imagination there, but something like that. And they got up and drove him out of the city and brought him to the crest of the hill on which their city had been built so that they should throw him down from the cliff. But he passed through their midst and went on his way down to Capernaum. See, I I would name this third sermon something like this. Is your unbelief your undoing? Is your unbelief your undoing? I'm going to show you a couple of passages in just a moment, but I I want for context to appreciate back in Matthew chapter uh, 13. I'm not ruining the future. I'm just going to tell you this story kind of goes on. So at the beginning of chapter 14, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus and said to the servants, This is John the Baptist. He himself has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are working him. So (laughs) Herod's sitting there going, I don't know where he gets this stuff. I cut off John's head. Maybe he got resurrected, his life force or something went in him, and that's how he's doing it. Everybody's trying to explain the miracles, and nobody's getting, you know, G-O-D, God, is among us. Then Jesus feeds 5,000, verse 14. Then he walks on water. He's walking on water. Uh, Peter says, uh, hey, Lord, if it's you, let me. And he hops out of the boat. The Lord says, come. And as he's looking at waves and all, he starts to sink. John's going to walk us through this. But verse 31, he says, immediately Jesus reached out with his hand and took hold of him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? didn't say of no faith, because he got out of the boat. That's more than I would have done, I'm sure. He got out of the boat, walks in the water, towards the Lord, and then looks around, and then doubts and sinks. You know, your unbelief may be your undoing, right? Hebrews 11, 6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently or earnestly seek him. That's how it works. There's this weird thing with human beings that we think God's going to be impressed by the stuff we do when what really moves the heart of God is a look of faith. What is it you're facing these days? You got purpose in your life? Is that a struggle? You're facing a potential divorce? Statistically, got to be. Job trouble, money trouble, relationship challenges, sickness. death. Your unbelief could be your undoing. What Jesus is saying and Paul says, Habakkuk and all the rest, is that, that the, the, the righteous, we live by faith. It's a faith proposition. It's taking God at his word and believing it And then something amazing happens. I'll tell you how this works. So the first thing to do if you want more faith in your life is to quit begging God for the same thing over and over again. I mean, you can do that, and there's some passages that say you can nag him into action. But what I've found is he sort of gets it. You know, I had a dad who um, uh, was a severe alcoholic, died of alcoholism. And uh, for about 12 years, uh, 12 years had no contact interaction with us because we had some boundaries and so nothing 12 years 
And I, I prayed for about three. Lord, have Dad reach out and whatever. I just keep a Southwest free pass in, my, in a folder ready to go anytime he might call. Fly back to Alabama. And I just say, Lord, please work in Dad's life. Please work in Dad's life. Please work in Dad's life. And finally, after about three years, God said, hey, uh, do you think I'm deaf or something? I went, no. I got it. I got it. So what I do? Well, I didn't need to keep saying it. He got it. He just was saying no or not yet. So I started instead thanking him. Because see, when you keep asking, it means you doubt because you have to keep asking. You know, your kids keep asking, can we do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, because they think, one, they got a chance, and right now they doubt they're going to get it, right? So you're, your children are teaching you how not to pray to God. Why don't you try that? So good lesson. Thank you, kids. Appreciate that. But, man, if your kids came in, if you said, yes, we'll go to the park, and they came in, Mom, thank you so much for um, taking us to the park later today. I'm so looking forward to it. You'd probably pack up then, for all I know. Well, that's with God. Thank Him. Thank Him for what He's promised. Thank Him for what He's going to do. Thank Him for what's related to this struggle in your life. The the, the, the second piece, uh, there are so many passages, but I just wanted to pick out the one in Romans chapter 10, just more narrowly right uh, there. The new Bible. Can't turn pages. If you look at 1017, it says, um, in the midst of this the whole conversation about Christ is then the law for righteousness for the one who believes. He in four, he goes through this process of, of faith, uh, conversation about faith, the words near you, it's the word of faith, verse eight. But as you go down, and he's talking about this sequence of how they're going to know unless we tell him, he has this phrase, uh, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And the word, word there is a little different word, and it's more about a specific thing. And I, I would say very pointedly, that's kind of what goes on in our life, that, that it's not just general truth, you know, like I know God or I'm trusting God, but but it's, it's a verse, it's a, it's a truth, it's an insight that you're trusting Him concerning, right? So, so when we have specific knowledge of a specific truth, it can change everything. So, so what are you struggling with, right? You, you, got, you got problems in your life? Do you really? And you know Christ, and you have problems in your life, right? You know Christ, you have problems in your life. One, welcome to reality, that's cool. Number two, Romans 8, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose, right? All things work together for good, all things, everything. What is that thing you're facing right now? What's that problem? You think He'll work that for good? That's what the text says. I mean, sometimes I'm a little too honest with God. I say, somehow I'll go, well, I'm going to be impressed with how you turn this to good. You know, not trying to be skeptical, but that's going to be interesting. By the way, Dad called out of the blue, went back, reconnected with him, got the kids to see him. While we were there, kids all saw him. He gave them all gifts, some token from his life, different things. And then while he was there, he passed away. Most incredible thing. We stayed there, spoke at his funeral. I mean, I was thanking God. And I watched what he did to work things to good. You know, when the Bible says, Jesus says, uh, it's not the way from the beginning, uh, it's intended that husbands and wives marry and stay together. Not condemn if that hadn't happened. Totally get it. As I quoted Rodney Dangerfield, Jody and I had 22 years of bliss, and then we met each other, right? 
not my fault that I'm a perfectionist and picky, so I married her, and she has very low standards, so she married me. It's just how it works out. <clears throat> Rejoice when you encounter various trials, <clears throat> knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let it have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. These trials that come in your life, when you embrace them with the right attitude, you rejoice because God's fixing to, as we'd say in Alabama, He's fixing to do something to grow you up, create humility, create insight. Create empathy. Create hope. If you understood what he's going to do with the trial and you had faith, because your unbelief is your undoing, you had faith, God can move even faster, and you will rejoice in the hope of what he's going to do. I'm totally convinced the first long while in heaven we're going to get up there after we do the, oh, you're here? You know, uh, Oh, well, I'm here, you know. After that, th there'll be that phase. And then the next phase is going to be like, oh, you know, like I finally get it. Well, you go ahead and get it by now by faith because your unbelief is your undoing. He did some miracles there, just didn't do many. And you look at your life and what you wrestle with in your life and what your struggles are. Uh, you have purpose? Let me tell you, Jesus can give you purpose. Why don't you find some verses that talk about that? You're seated in Christ in the heavenlies. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Be forward-looking in that regard. Your trials, your struggles, your own death. It's coming for all of us because there's a time to be born and a time to die. And we think we get to argue with God about what that means. No, no. It's in faith. You believe and you act. What else does faith without works is dead mean? It means you are to believe and then you act. This is about our growth. And, and we find in this passage sitting here just staring straight at us that our unbelief is our undoing. And you see this over and over and over in Scripture. For whatever reason, God responds wonderfully to faith. And God responds rejectfully to unbelief. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. When I came to Christ in college, that was one verse I wrote down and kept my pocket and snuck around with and pulled it out and read all day because I needed more than anything to be a different person than who I'd been. Whew. We had that verified because when Jody and I started dating, all her friends would say, do you know about him? You seen the rap sheet? You know, that kind of stuff. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Galatians 2.20. The power of God, if you have a little faith, to work in your heart, to move, to clarify, to forgive, to rejoice, to serve, in my case often, to shut up. Faith. Your unbelief can be your undoing. The less you know this, the less you can believe. And quite frankly, you are special. And it's too bad your hometown doesn't get it. And you know what else? Some of this stuff's offensive. And that's probably a problem with me and with you. Not it. But more than anything, you got the opportunity to open this book, to see truth, 
and ask the question I like to ask, which is, what if this is true? What if this is really true? Hey, it says, I'm forgiven for all my sins. What if that's really true? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him, I'm one. Whoever believed in me would not perish, but have everlasting life. I believe this says, I'll have everlasting life. What if that's true? Your unbelief is your undoing. So we might move that to end with this thought. Your belief is your blessing. Because God's pleasure in our believing. Father, as we transition to your table, as we consider the amazing moment of the Lord of glory going to the people who'd seen him grow up, even knowing from Luke earlier that he was growing as a child in wisdom and favor. I don't quite know how you took it all so well. But rejection and your love and your offer to them and, and all you're inviting them to do is just to believe. And they take offense. And they can't explain the miraculous. Ugh. Have mercy on us to not follow in that path. But rather with that need, that struggle, that difficulty, that hope, whatever's going on in everyone's life today, that they might find truth in your word and cling to it and believe in it and find their hope and peace in you. Amen.